Welcome to Balanced Life with Debbie Carlin Boyle, conversations connecting to a healthier you, the show that gives you all the latest and greatest health and wellness information to inspire you to live a life of balance and joy. Debbie Carlin Boyle is a health and nutrition coach, personal trainer, and fitness instructor who helps her clients live in balance with everything that feeds us in addition to the food on our plate. Please welcome your host, Debbie Carlin Boyle. Hello. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Welcome this Tuesday afternoon. Sunny downtown Burbank. The strike is over. Yay. We're in the middle of November 2023. And really excited. Strike is over. But it's a lot more crowded in this area because we're at Burbank Studios. So (laughs) people are starting to move and get back on set, which is a really wonderful thing for the economy around here. And I would say across the country and even the world for that matter. So welcome. I'm glad you're with me today. You have reached my show, which is Balanced Life with Debbie Carlin Boyle, Conversations That Connect to a Healthier You. I have conversations that help you learn a little bit more about how to create longevity with quality in your life, because that's what it's all about. We want to get those numbers up and chronologically get our age number up, but we also don't want to deteriorate our health going down as that happens. And so my show specifically features guests with products and services. Most of them have written great books with information and have all kinds of workshops, individual ways that they can work with you, and group uh, ways that they can work with you so you can get involved with anything that like resonates with you. I have hundreds of shows on my YouTube channel. I've been doing this for eight years. So I have two YouTube channels. One when I had co-host, Dell and Debbie's Mind, Body, and Soul. And the other one is Balanced Life by Debbie. So both those YouTube channels, between the two of them, over 250 shows. And every single show is different, and every single topic is health and wellness related. So I invite you to join me on there. You can get subscribe, and you get notified every time a new show comes up. It's Balanced Life by Debbie, D-E-B-I, YouTube. And we are streaming live there today, and all my other shows are there as well. So go there today, or you can go there and look at all the archives of shows that I have. I also want to tell you a little bit about how you can get involved in the conversation today. We would love to have you call in. That's why I call it Conversations Connecting to a Healthier You, because it's not just me and my guest, but it's also the audience and how you can get involved. So the number here is area code 323-524-2599. Again, 323-524-2599. Call us, ask a question, make a comment. If you're watching on my YouTube channel or my Facebook page, which is Balanced Life by Debbie as well, Facebook, you can, in the comment section, make a comment, ask a question during the show if you don't want to call in. I check that section when we take our break, and we'll answer the question live here today while my guest is with us. So I'd love for you to do that. I also want to tell you really quickly about myself. I am a personal trainer, a fitness instructor, and a health and nutrition coach. And I help people, just as I do with my show, find balance in their own individual lives. I help you align all the things that need to come together in addition to the food on our plate, which is very important. But there's a lot of other things that need to come together so we can have that longevity with quality. Age young, as I say, the name of the book that I have coming out. So all those little things, whether it be finances, creativity, social life, how you live in your environment, what your career is, exercise, your sleep, all those little things that you think might, you know, you take for granted, well, they need to kind of level out and come together so you optimize them and that you have that life of longevity with quality. And sometimes it's hard to do that on your own. I think we all need a coach for what our passion is and we can take it up a step 
two steps, three steps, and really create the life that we want. Because the ultimate thing is to live a life of joy. So to find that joy, I'm here to help you. So to do that, you go to my website, Balanced Life by Debbie, D-E. BI.com. There you'll find the services, the ways you can get in touch with me. A pop up will pop right up. It's a fall detox. It's three days, three recipes a day that are satiating, delicious, easy to make, got a shopping list attached to it. Just go ahead and notify me and I'll send that information right back to you. So if you want to work with me, you can do the exact same thing. It says contact me here and I would love to hear from you. Let me know that you watched this show today. So without further ado, the show today is really important for longevity quality. I think that's what this is all about. So I'm going to get on with the introduction because I have a good in-studio guest today, and I love when I have in-studio guests. I just do. She flew all the way in from Napa, California, just for the day, just to do this show. So on with the introductions we go. So many people today are heavily impacted by Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. The Alzheimer's Association and the World Organization have projected that the number of people who will develop Alzheimer's disease by the year 2050 worldwide will triple if a treatment or a cure is not found. Society is not prepared to care for the onslaught of people who will develop this devastating disease. In her 30 years of working with family members and caregivers who suffer from dementia, my guest today, Lisa Skinner, has recognized how little people really understand the complexities of what living with the disease is really like. For Lisa, it starts with knowledge, education, and training. Author Lisa Skinner is a behavioral specialist with expertise in Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. In her 30-plus year career working with family members and caregivers, Lisa has taught them how to successfully navigate the many challenges that accompany this heartbreaking disease. Lisa is both a certified dementia practitioner and is also a certified dementia care trainer through the Alzheimer's Association. She also holds a degree in human behavior behavior. Her latest book, Truth, Lies, and Alzheimer's, Its Secret Faces, continues Lisa's quest of working with dementia-related illnesses and teaching families and caregivers how to better understand the daunting challenges of brain disease. Her number one bestseller book, Not All Who Wandered Need Be Lost, was written at their urging. As someone who has had eight family members diagnosed with dementia, Lisa helps explain behaviors caused by dementia, encourages those who feel burdened, and gives practical advice for how to respond. So with that, without further ado, will you please welcome my guest, Lisa Skinner, to the show. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you so much. Hi, Lisa. Our audience, our audience is here in the walls, but we have one. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for coming this way and for uh, joining me today in studio. It's always a little bit better to look at somebody eye to eye. I understand. So. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me down. It's been a, a kind of a fun adventure coming Good. down, flying down today. So Good. Yeah. I'm glad. You came on a sunny day. I know it's raining up north. That rain's heading our way. You're going to probably go back into it. But I really appreciate, in spite of you know get, uh, the obstacles, that you did come all this way. And I'm glad to... Uh, have you been to Burbank or oh, this yeah. area before? Okay. Oh, I, sur- I yeah. sure have. Yeah. yeah. Are you from Northern California? I am. I grew you up are. in Marin County. Oh. Okay, so that's why you're up there, Um, which is going to lead me into talking about your childhood, because I know that there's a story there, which is why you do what you do today. But I want to hear a little bit about your childhood, like how you grew up, what your family life was like, where you went to school, and then you can get into the story that actually really hit you hard and stayed with you that you know, this is why you do what you do. Okay. So tell us about yourself. All right. So as I mentioned, I grew up in uh, Marin County, which is just north of the Golden Gate Bridge. My father was a litigator in San Francisco. And both my parents actually grew up in Marin County, which is 
kind of unusual it today. is it yeah. is even being southern even californians is unusual yeah you know yeah so my grandmother uh lived in marin county my mom grew up there and so i had a close relationship with my grandmother growing up because my mother was always dropping the, the three of us off at her house and so you had two siblings yeah and, a brother and a sister yeah. And my grandmother was a caterer. Oh. And so she put, put us to work picking walnuts off of her tree, walnut trees in her backyard, and, and making us help her um, bake cookies for her different catering events. And it was a lot of fun. She was just probably the best cook on the planet, in my opinion. Well, when I was 16 years old, and I had just recently gotten my driver's license. I went to visit my grandmother, who only lived a few miles away from the family home. And we routinely sat down in the living room to have a nice, just pleasant visit. And out of nowhere, she started talking to me about the birds that lived in her mattress mm. and came out at night and pecked at her face. Mm -hmm. She pointed to the walls and told me that there were rats running all along her walls and they were going to invade her home. Mm -hmm. She proceeded to tell me about these men that were constantly trying to break into her home. And she they were stealing her jewelry and she knew that they were going to kill her. Mm -hmm. And... I'm sitting Frightening there. for a 16-year-old to hear. Well, besides and, that, I had not, there was no evidence. This is like the first she displayed of what. So there was nothing leading up to that. Because that's pretty drastic without drastic. any, like, memory loss. Like, where did, you know, I put my keys kind of thing even before the, that. There but. was a little bit of evidence towards normal aging forgetfulness. Yeah. After thinking back. But not these just. Far-fetched stories. Stories, yeah. This hit suddenly all it at really once. Did. Yeah, that's frightening for for her and for you. I wasn't quite sure, to be honest with you, how I should react to these wild stories she's telling me. But you know, I grew up with my grandmother, as I said. She, I had never known her to lie, to embellish anything. She was a sweet, demure little lady. So I said, Grandma. I'm really interested to f hear more about your birds. Okay. And I said, uh, I've never heard anything quite like this, so I'm really intrigued. Can Let's go into your bedroom, and I want you to show me where these birds are coming in and out of your mattress, so maybe we can do something about it. So I let her into her bedroom. I threw the covers off her mattress. I pushed it up, looked underneath, and I said, Grandma, I'm just not seeing any evidence of any birds getting in and out of your mattress. Do you know where they're, where they're coming from? And she looks me straight in the face and says, Oh, Lisa, they are there. They're just very, very clever. Wow. And I thought that was just a <laughs> classic response. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, doing this professionally for 30 years now, I know it was a classic response because people who live with Alzheimer's disease and dementia cover up some of the things they tell you. Yes, they do. Yeah. Yeah. I can, I, I, well, I've had personal experience. So. Okay. But, yeah. And I don't think people realize that or know that. So. No. So, anyway, I didn't argue with her. I didn't contradict her. I was taught not to. Mm -hmm. You don't you don't contradict your grandmother. But I went home and I said to my mother, I said, "What's going on with grandma?" I mean, she's telling me these unbelievable stories and I just didn't know how to respond to them. And she says to me, "Oh, grandma's been diagnosed with senile dementia." I said, "Oh, thanks for telling oh, me." Oh, yeah, I was yeah. going to say, <laughs> yeah, no warning. Yeah. So anyway, kind of to continue with the story, and this is to really address your question because it this is what really made the impact on me, uh -huh. is shortly after I confronted my mother about 
these symptoms that my grandmother was displaying, a police officer, the chief of police, knocked on our door and said to my mother, I'm the chief of police and your mother has been calling our department four, five, six, seven times a day. Mm. And at first we sent a patrol officer out to check out her claims and you know, it, this, this just continues and continues and continues and we can't find any evidence of anything going on there. And he looks my mom straight in the eye and said, you know what? I just need to tell you, you've got to do something with her. She's a nut. She's an absolute mm, nutcase. That's cruel. It was very cruel. Mm -hmm. And I, that, he, standing there hearing this man who was in the position in the community to protect the citizens mm -hmm. and give people the benefit of the doubt that maybe there was something going on with her and just flat out calls her a nutcase. And that, to this day, has um, never left I'm my sure. brain. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I mean, you you parlayed an entire career yes. around the treatment of your grandmother, knowing that she had dementia, and that he was very un uh, had no empathy and was cruel, and it, which is counterproductive to what he should be doing, and obviously uneducated about how to handle somebody. I, I would hope this day and age it's better, but you you'll know better. You'll be able to answer that, but. That, I can imagine why that stuck with you. It yeah. would stick with me pretty heavy, too. Well, to be honest with you, things have not changed that much. Maybe just starting to change in the last couple of years since our COVID pandemic. Mm -hmm. But as you mentioned in the introduction, I've been doing this professionally for 30 years. Yeah, it's a long and time. And I have not seen a lot of change uh, in terms of paradigm shifts, understanding the disease. We don't necessarily call it senile dementia anymore. We've come... Right, we don't say the word senile yeah. anymore, that they're senile, because that is... So, yeah, that's kind of a, a more nuanced thing. It's kind of a woke thing in that it's derogatory. It's derogatory. But it doesn't, still doesn't mean that the behavior towards somebody who has, and there are many forms of dementia, many stages. It takes, as you well know, uh, and I think, you know, pe people are maybe being more sympathetic or delicate about it, but doesn't mean that they're educated on how to handle And that's what you're all about. That's exactly is, you know. An, a, there are many books on this is what dementia is. This is, you know, there are prevention books. There are books talking about the levels and the different, you know, uh, how long does someone live with dementia based on what you see and all of that. But there aren't what I've seen. And like I said, I've been doing this eight years. I have not seen a book or a person that specifically deals with the people who are caretaking and the ones that love the person who has dis, you know, um, this um, disintegrating brain, basically, power. And uh, you hit on it so succinctly and so smart to keep with love and compassion that I've never seen that. Oh, I think well, it's so you. important. So when you went to school, did you what? So when you went to college, did you study psychology, behavioral sciences? What, knowing what happened to you when you were sixteen, you just said, "I got to do something about this." Did was that like a purposeful, mindful thing, or did you fall into it later? It was kind of an accident. I chose to go down the Yellow Brook Road, and when I got to the Scarecrow, I didn't know which direction to, to go towards. And I took a course on human behavior, and I was sold, because I've always been fascinated in human behavior. Mm -hmm. It's like, why do people act the way they act? What makes them tick? Mm -hmm. And that's always fascinated me. So I went ahead and I got my degree in, or, in uh, organi organizational communication slash human behavior. And I accidentally stumbled into a position at a community 
and the position was called community counselor. And what I did, my job was to assess the um, potential residents coming in and to determine if they were a proper fit for the environment. And it did not take me very long to realize that this truly was going to be my calling. Oh, good. And then since then, I've had seven more family members mm -hmm. develop one of the brain diseases that causes dementia. And I've had a dog with doggy dementia. Yeah, I know there's a chapter in your book there about is. that. And we're actually, we, we can talk about that today because yeah. it's on my list of well, things Well, a lot of people don't about. even realize that dogs get dementia. So I thought it was going to be an important topic to include in the book because we tr a lot of us treat our, our pets like they're definitely part of our family. Yes. And they do actually develop canine cognitive dysfunction. I've seen it. I had a dog that I recently, Tony knew, I had a dog that uh, recently passed at 17 and a half. She was almost 18. And uh, those that last year or two, I definitely recognized that she had dementia. Yeah. Definitely recognized it. But, you know, that came with age, it came with other things, you know. And I, I do want to talk about it. What do you, what would you say is the definition of dementia and Alzheimer's. Are they the same thing? What's the difference? Because I alluded to the fact there are many stages and different things, different ways to be diagnosed. Um, what is the definition? What would you give a that's professional a, definition? Okay, that's a great question. It's probably one of the most common questions that people ask me. And the, my best explanation for really understanding the difference between Alzheimer's disease and dementia is this. Alzheimer's disease is one of over a hundred brain diseases that we know of that causes dementia. So when I'm using the term dementia, I'm really using it as an umbrella term to describe the symptomology, the behaviors, all of the signs and everything that is associated with the brain disease that's causing the damage to the brain. So think of it like this. Um, you suddenly come down with a cold. Mm hmm and you've got these symptoms that uh, are telling you, I've got something going on, a virus. Right. Is it COVID? Is it the flu? Is a it cold? A cold? Or, yeah, just a common cold. So you decide to go to your doctor and you are describing your symptoms to the medical assistant. The doctor comes in, you, you know, it's up to him to give you the diagnosis. But what you're describing to your doctor are the symptoms that you're experiencing. Right. So think of those symptoms as being the brain disease, the Alzheimer's disease, the Lewy body disease. Mm -hmm. And the dementia is the broad term that we use to refer to the symptoms that you're describing. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. So is it, um, so from a more scientific or physiology, uh, physiological point of view of what actually is going on in the brain, what's happening? What are we losing? Is there plaque buildup? Is, yes, okay. So, and, and there are different levels for different people, so that would put them at a different stage of dementia? There are many stages. Uh, some medical professionals use the three-stage model and others go by the what we call the seven-stage model, mm, okay. which is just, uh, uh, they're basically the same thing. Everybody progresses through these stages of the disease differently. But um, the seven-stage model seems to go by more quickly you know, you go from one stage to the next more quickly because there's more of them. Right. And the three-stage model is really broken down to mild, moderate, okay. and severe. It's more broad. It's, it's more just more broad. broad, not as intricate. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. It's, 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 it's fascinating, and it's frightening to everybody because nobody is, like, exempt from, you nobody know. Is. And, and there's that fear of, I know you went through a day where you actually were b be able to um, go to a, a like a virtual yes. 
experience of what it's, and talk about getting having empathy after that. Wow, we're, we'll get into that. But we actually have some calls. So I want to take the first call. Caller, are you there? Caller, are you there? Hi. Hi. Yes, hi. Hi. What's your name and where are you calling from? Hi, my name is Betsy Sloan. I'm calling from Island, New Jersey. Oh, well, welcome, Betsy. Welcome. Hi, Betsy. You s- Hi, Lisa. You have a great guest on there today, Debbie. Ah, uh, you're a friend. <laughs> Lisa, no. Do you, are, are you yeah. aware, you're aware of Lisa and her work, obviously. Um, do you have a question about the show today and what we're talking about, what Lisa's expertise is? Yes, I would like uh, for Lisa to explain to your audience, because a lot of times people don't understand what to do when someone hallucinates. They try to rationalize, which they shouldn't do. I had to learn the hard way. My mother-in-law, when there wasn't the information 23 years ago, and, you know, education is very important, and I'm so glad Lisa's doing what she's doing, but if Lisa could tell the audience what someone should do when someone is hallucinating, I think would be great. Yeah, yeah, well, Thank I, I, I think it's important. Thank you for that question, Betsy. Yeah, so. So a hallucination in people who live with Alzheimer's disease and dementia is really a type of false belief. So hallucinations usually include people seeing things that aren't there. Kind of like your grandmother and the birds? And the birds. Yeah. That actually is a hallucination. Yeah. That, yeah. Um, My mom had that oh, too, by the way. Yes. Okay. Very prevalent. Yeah. So There's also another um, set of symptoms that we call delusions, which are also false beliefs, but they're a little different. And so what we want to do, and this is probably one of the most critical aspects of trying to manage this disease on a day-to-day basis because you never know what's going to show up. Mm -hmm. And there are best practices to effectively communicating and managing this part of the disease. And there are um, other practices that are not quite as effective. And we know what's working because for the last 30, 40 years, there have been so many different approaches practiced and and therapies practiced and techniques. So, you know, 30 years ago, we practiced what's called um, reorientation therapy. Mm. And what the therapists did was they sat with the residents in the assisted living or the memory care facility and and they um, reinforced their reality. So if they didn't really um, remember where they were, they reinforced their surroundings. They reinforced the time of what time it was of the day, what time, what the current events that were happening. And as it turns out, this That's, approach did not work. It's not a good thing. Yeah. No. Mm-hmm. It, didn't, it didn't work at all. Because you're trying to convince someone something that is go- not. That's exactly right. It's not right. convincible. Yeah. That's exactly right. So you've got to kind of meet them where they're at, correct? You need yeah. to embrace their world and join, mm-hmm. what, do what we call join their reality. And I will give you an example if that's okay. Yeah, sure. That helps. So this happened with my mother-in-law who was kind of in the mid stage of her dementia. And she was, we took turns as a family taking care of her. And she was over at my house one Sunday and she was sitting on the sofa and we were having a really nice visit. And just out of nowhere, she jumped up off the sofa and in a panic, she said to me, does Marty know I'm here? Mm. Does he know I'm here? I've got to get home. I've got to fix some dinner. Well, Marty was her late husband. Yeah. And just like on the spin of a dime, it's that short-term memory kind of short-circuited out on her. And all of a sudden, she was living her reality thinking her late husband was sitting home waiting That's for common. her. It's very common. Mm-hmm. And most people in the old ways would say, which doesn't work, 
No, and try to bring them into present that, don't you remember, Marty died 20-whatever years ago. This is blah, blah, blah. That doesn't sit well. So what what is the better thing okay, to so have do? Okay, so that typically is our instinctive reaction. Uh, yes, I'm, Be- I did it. You because, know? Me yes. too. Because we want to fix our loved ones. We want to pull them back mm-hmm. into our reality. Right. It doesn't work. Mm-mm. And think about this. If I had done that and said to Marianne, Marianne, don't you remember? Marty died five years ago. He can't be sitting at home waiting for you. That could have sent her into an absolute panic. Mm -hmm. Because in her mind, during that period of time, she obviously didn't remember that he had passed. Right. To her, he was alive and well and waiting for his dinner. So this is what we have so, come to realize. But, so what do would you say to her? Well, I'll that, tell you what I said yeah. to her. I said, oh, no, Marianne, it, um, Marty just called. I oh, just so got off the he, phone with him. Okay. And he knows you're here. He knows we're having a wonderful visit. I told him I would bring you home very soon so uh, she could fix you, her, you could fix him, her, your dinner. And that everything was fine and he says well i don't want to disrupt her visit with her son and daughter-in-law so just tell her to relax take her time and then you could see her entire demeanor change oh so smart she relaxed she sat back down she said are you sure he doesn't mind i said no i promise he's he's fine with it wow and once i kind of addressed her concern and removed that concern from her mind because once they latch on to a, to a, a belief as long as they're concerned about it they don't let it go right so as soon as i told her that he was perfectly fine with her being there um she said are you sure wanted the reassurance and sat back down and about a half hour later I took her home and she was back to her normal self yeah. um, for the rest of the visit. Yeah, you didn't make it worse, you made it better. And that's and people need those skills. They need your book. <laughs> they need well, the skills to and do that. This is the one uh, area that I have seen such a shortfall in the 30 years that I've been doing this professionally is we need a better mechanism for helping people understand this disease and helping people understand what's happening to the brains of those who are yes. living with this disease and where these reactions come from, what triggers these reactions, where, what's happening to the brain. And this is the biggest shortfall that I have, have come across. Have come I across bet. That I, bet. I feel people really need. Betsy, are you still there? Did that, that was a great question. I think our audience needed to hear that answer. We're going to keep on this realm of how, because there's so many different scenarios that come up with people with dementia and how we should approach it. Did that help, Betsy? We lost oh, her. Yes, oh, yeah, definitely. There. <laughs> okay. uh, um, my husband had early onset Alzheimer's, but when the time that Matt hallucinated, I had educated myself so I knew what to do and told our son what to do. And it makes such a big difference when Love. a caregiver is educated. Love hearing that. So I'm lucky I to rec- have yeah, to have Lisa. Lisa and her expertise in your in your court. Wow. Yes, definitely. Well, I want to thank you for calling in and endorsing Lisa with your own personal experience. Um, And we're going to get to how people can get in touch with you if they're going through how they can get a hold of your book and all of that. Thank you so much, Betsy. Have a beautiful afternoon or evening back east now. (laughs) So thank you for checking this out. Keep listening. Thanks, Betsy. Okay, bye bye. Bye. Yeah, that's that was a great question because I think that we, I think all of us can have experienced somebody with dementia in our life. Most of us, if we're grown, as grown ups, even from a teenage age, I've experienced it. My parents, my in laws, I've seen it, um, and I kept 
doing the correcting thing, like I was saying. So I think most people do that and don't know how to handle it. I mean, what a great service you are doing. Well, it's counterintuitive. Yeah. It's very counterintuitive to... um, to know to respond that way because, as I said, just we making want, it worse. Yeah, it's making it worse. And you don't want to make somebody who's already in distress yes. more just dis- more distress. We'll talk about the different things besides, um, you know, loss of memory and and um, hallucinations, all the other different things and the other ways. But we're going to take a quick break from a sponsor of mine. And when we come back, do we still have the second call holding? No, they left. Okay, that's fine. Um, Because we're going to hit everything anyway. But if you're listening and you want to call back and you've got a question, we'll take your call. I know we're, we got a lot to talk about, but we'll take a really quick break and we're going to get back and get into what we should be doing with people who do have dementia. We'll be right back after this word. Cicera Olio de Oliva is an extra virgin olive oil company with a mission to provide high quality current season Italian oils to families. They have partnered with two centuries old family farms in the Tuscany region of Italy to grow, harvest, and bottle their amazing oils. Founded by a nutritionist who has a love of the land, sustainability, nutritious foods, and of course, Italy, they strive for a peak freshness and high nutritional content in every single bottle. All of their oils are current season, extra virgin olive oil, bringing you a true branch to bottle experience. And I know firsthand. So for an offer, go to www.cesiraoliodoliva.com and enter Balanced Life 10 for 10% off. I know you're going to love this healthy and delicious addition to just about any meal. We're back. Welcome. I'd like to welcome my guest today, Lisa Skinner. Lisa has written an amazing book about, uh, for caretakers really, or for people that have loved ones that are living with dementia or Alzheimer's. And we're talking and we're talking really about how to deal with that. This book is Truth, Lies, and Alzheimer's, The Secret Faces. Secret Faces, Lies. Well, I got that wrong. What's the last part of that, Lisa? It's Secret Faces. It's a Secret Faces faces and good good title because it it says a lot um we already touched on hallucinations and uh somebody who's got memory loss and going back to something in the past doesn't and how to handle that but there's a lot of other things that people who are having um dementia and, and losing memory and things uh go through besides hallucinations can you talk about that and give us some pointers on each one of the situations on how to deal with like a lot of repetitive stories and rather than tell the person oh you just said that you just said that you just i dealt with my mother that way first I didn't know when she was first, she wasn't diagnosed yet. And, you know, unfortunately in my family, um, there were four kids, there were four of us, and not all four of us were on the same page. So we ha- I had one sibling especially who was in denial. So we should talk about that because if one person is doing the wrong thing and everybody else is trying to handle their loved one the correct way, you know, that he refused to educate himself on the fact that no longer could she live alone and that she did have dementia. And then, you know, she had full on Alzheimer's by the time she was diagnosed. He just, he fought us. And I mean, he was trying to go to court to fight us about giving her the proper care. So could you talk about that, the different things that come up that families can look for and how we deal with other members of the family that maybe aren't on board? Yes, and this is a very, very, very common dynamic between family members. I have counseled so many people in um, that kind of have split themselves into camps, my mm-hmm. own family included. Mm. I mentioned my mother-in-law And there were definitely two camps. Because there's that denial thing going on. And a lot of guilt. Yeah. And, you know, some of the siblings have 
a hidden agenda. They don't want to spend down all the money that they yeah, may Yeah, that was part of okay. my brother's problem. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, there's one story in my book um, about this very topic where the, um, the brother, there was a, a brother and a sister, and she had been doing a lot of her own due diligence and, and research on living with Alzheimer's disease and had pretty much come drawn the conclusion that their dad needed to be in a memory care facility. Mm -hmm. And the brother was adamant. I could never do that to my dad. Same exact situation. Same situation in our family. Yeah. And what was happening on a regular basis, and, and this is very common, the dad was leaving the house, getting in his car, driving over to a Hooters restaurant, mm. and trying to ask the wait staff out on dates mm -hmm. at, in his 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. And the restaurant manager kept calling and the brother or the son and saying, we really can't have this. And kind of like my grandmother, you really need to think about an alternative solution to this situation, and he just wouldn't have it. So the police actually found this man sleeping in his car in the Hooters parking lot one right. night, and he had been missing for two days. Oh, no. And the daughter said, okay, that's it. This is not safe. This is not good. Uh, we didn't know where he was for a couple days. So the son finally, or the brother finally conceded and said, okay, we'll try it out. And they went to visit him in the memory care center because he actually was had progressed too far into the disease to qualify for assisted living. Mm. Mm -hmm. And they went to visit him and they were blown away at how happy he appeared to be. Oh, because, well, he, uh, uh, hopefully he was with people, caretakers that knew how to take care exactly. of them in the correct way. And she did her homework. So, yeah. She Smart. found um, a, a thriving environment for him. They gave him a job. He was so proud of his job. He felt he had a purpose. He felt he had a meaningful life again where he didn't feel that way when he was home alone. And, you know, these are the things that, that we see and that we yeah. can expect. And, you know, aside from the safety concerns, there are so many reasons to provide a stimulating and meaningful environment to our loved ones. Yeah, it's advantageous for them. Exactly. Because there's a lot of loneliness that comes with it. Because not only there's like the physical, we had to get my mom out of a situation where she was living alone. And like I said, by the time she was diagnosed, her doctor who did the assessment that I was that when she was admitted into the assistant living facility, um, I got yelled at. Because my other siblings weren't there. I'm the one who, you know, followed the uh, ambulance over because she ended up in the hospital because she ended up falling in her house by herself and a neighbor found her, you know, and it was just all wrong. But we were trying not to step on my brother's toes. It was a whole thing. And he yelled at me. He said, how long has this been going on? I said, for a while, but it isn't me. I have siblings. And he said, well, she she's depressed. She's she needs help. And, you, and, and I said, well, we had a lot of opposition. And he said, well, I'm glad she's finally here. You know, that's, and it just, it was such a relief to me. But my brother fought us all the way, even after that. He kept, because once a person is diagnosed, they can't go back and redo a will or get somebody to become uh, executor of their estate. Right. He was bringing papers for her to sign. Yeah. See, he did have an ulterior motive, and um, and it we were trying to tell him it's illegal, and then we had to get a lawyer involved. You know, it was just it it I could, it just brings this. If you don't educate yourself and you don't know how to handle when something like a parent or an in law or a grandparent and this happens to, it pulls pa families apart. Oh, absolutely. Which I think is just awful. You know, unfortunately, we're down to the last five minutes, Aww. and there's so much to hit on. It really is. So I I want you to um, 
I want to touch, because I am a health and wellness show, I want to touch a little bit about prevention, because I know studies have come out recently about, um, uh, you, you know, not recently, we've known for years that lifestyle plays a part into being able to work, get, keep this from coming too early or even at all. And what I saw in my family got, is part of the reason why I got into this health and wellness thing. And, and I know food is medicine. Medicine's food. It can harm you and it can heal you. And if you want to keep all those neurons, you know, uh, 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 what do you call activated, then food is the way to do it because gut health is brain health. Um, so there is it, it's the diet. There, there was a new study that recently came out. Um, it's the what? What's the diet that? Oh, it's it's the Mediterranean diet, yes. basically, which yes. is what I was going to say about the olive oil. I mean, that is a component that is one of the healthiest oils you can do, and it's a component of longevity. And there's the blue zones. What we know in the blue zones, these people that live to be centurions, that don't have dementia. They have a high quality of life and they're still very active with what they do and what they say and part of conversations. And looking at those zones and all the things that they are doing could be a very preventative, is a preventative way of keeping this dementia uh, uh, away. And that's you know? exactly right. And so many of the things that you said in your introduction, not of me, but of your show, resonated with me because they're so true, and you know this from the work you do. There is definitely truth to the adage, we are what we eat. Mm -hmm. Big time. And this is not me saying this. This is not you saying this. These are evidence-based studies, scientifically peer-reviewed studies that have shown correlation between the foods we choose and these are these all play a part, and I know we don't have a whole lot of time, but they all play a part in whether our, as individuals, our risk of developing Alzheimer's disease is going to be diminished or, or escalated. Max, or escalated. Yeah. And there are so many of these risk yeah. factors that play a role, but... You know, the number one risk factor is age, and we can't do anything about that. Right. But we can certainly do something about the foods we choose to eat. And, and you're right. The lifestyle. Mediterranean diet is the recommended diet. It's the complex carbohydrates, and it's um, the leafy green vegetables. Big time. That's the main thing that yes. you should the, – these phytochemicals that you get from the leafy green vegetables or, or the dark vegetables, even a variety. Eat the rainbow. I talk about that all the time. Make that – Three quarters of your plate. Yeah. That's what it should be. And then the protein, of course. Lean uh, meats, though. Yes. More fish and, and yeah. less Wild red meat. caught, mm -hmm. free range, source of meat. What that, what, whatever that, if you are going animal based, whatever that animal ate, guess what? You're eating it too. It's going into your body. Because we, when we think about food, we have to think about once we get, once we get satiated, once we get the tastes and flavors and all that out of our mouth, then it, the food's doing its job. You're vitamins, minerals, and nutrients are going to work. But if you're putting toxins and chemicals and processed food in your body, it's going to work and it's getting stuck. It doesn't know where to go. So what it does is it causes all different kinds of diseases, cancers. Inflammation. Yes. And, inflammation and we know is where it starts. Yep. The number one worst foods for us to ingest are the ultra-processed foods. So exactly. anything that has... Sugar. Yeah. yeah. Our sugar. brains do not like sugar. No. No, but we're addicted to it. And a new study just came out recently. I think I read about it yesterday or today about young kids, teens, anger management and violence. And those that it, there was almost a 100 percent turnaround of those kids who changed their diet to get away from junk food and ultra processed food and start eating more of a Mediterranean diet, their entire behavior changed this in school. There's studies me. that because it causes brain fog. Yeah. And there's studies, everything changed. I mean prevention is key. It is. But in the one minute we have left, I want you to tell the audience how they can get your book, how they can get a hold of you. I know you have programs that you do with groups. How do how can they reach you? Uh, the best way to find me is um, I'm on Facebook under Lisa Skinner Author. 
Mm-hmm. You can find my books. We have a Spanish version of the book. The, the book that um, Tony has been putting on the screen, there's a Spanish version. Oh, you've got it up there. Yeah. Um, it's I, on Amazon, right? It's on Amazon. I've got just an amazing audio book that I recommend. That's my favorite because I love the woman who narrated the oh, book. okay. And then real quickly, I do have a brand new training program okay. coming up that I am going to release in January. And um, I can put the information as it comes out on my Facebook page um, to provide you with more details about how you're going to be able to access that. That's great. And we'll give your website also. TruthLiesAlzheimer's.com. Okay. All one word, no um, apostrophes or anything. Fabulous. Fabulous. Lisa, thank you. Thank you. And I want to tell you to go to Lisa's Facebook page because there she has all these bullet points of all the different things that may come up with somebody with dementia or Alzheimer's and how you should handle it. Just like the couple of stories she told here. There's many more that we didn't touch on, but they're all in the book and the Facebook page kind of highlights it. So I suggest you go there if you are dealing with someone, like I said, in our lifetime, we will be dealing with a loved one some way, some shape, somehow. So this is so needed. I thank you for coming all the way here. I really do. Thanks and again for having me. Oh, it was a pleasure. We just didn't have enough time. No, there never is. <laughs> I know, there never is. <laughs> and I want to thank you, the audience, for joining us today. Go ahead and leave a comment. If you weren't able to call in or if you did call in and didn't get through, ask that question, make the comment, Lisa will answer you. You'll just go right back to the Facebook page and we're going to keep the conversation going because just have uh, that's what I call my show conversations that connect to a healthier you so go out and find more conversations that connect to a healthier you and I'll be here in two weeks and then we'll see you back again thank you everybody thank you for joining us again thank you Lisa thank you